Okay, are we ready for this morning? Yeah. Yes? I don't, I, don't, I don't feel the excitement yet. Are you ready for this morning? I know you've been ready all morning, but we're going to open up God's Word, and I'm excited to preach this um, message because it deals with history, it deals with uh, archaeology, and those are a couple things that just excite me is when things actually um, enhance our faith is what we're going to talk about this morning. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. Uh, we'd love to pass out a Bible to you. There's going to be a couple scriptures that I go to, but I will read them to you as well. And we're really only going to spend time in one scripture maybe in the Bible, which is Luke 3, 1, if you just want to open your Bibles to it. And uh, we'll get to that in a few minutes during this message. But if you need one, just raise your hand. Dwayne will pass one out to you. And we are preaching or teaching message number three for The Case for Christ. If you don't know what The Case for Christ is, it's a book written by Lee Strobel. And Lee Strobel um, was an atheist and taking a journey to disprove Christianity ended up becoming a Christian in the end. And he writes this book as information to show us what we can believe about our faith. And this morning what we're going to do is spend the time talking about the scientific and this is where we're getting a little bit outside the Bible, but the scientific evidences of the, our faith and the scientific evidences that show us that the Bible and that Jesus is true, which will enhance our faith. And so what we're going to do is we're going to put Jesus on trial this morning. For week number three of our message, we're going to put Jesus on trial and if you've ever been in a courtroom, you know that there's a judge, there's a juror, and you guys are the jurors, and you will decide if Jesus is innocent or guilty. In fact, you'll decide if the whole Christian faith is innocent or guilty, and we're going to just imagine that Jesus is guilty until proven innocent. And why am I able to do that? Because our faith rests on 2,000 years of history of the resurrection. Our faith has been challenged and twisted, and there have been scholars who have researched. And let me just tell you, you can analyze it, you can lift it up, you can check underneath the carpet of the Christian faith in a sense, and you will find that it is true and it is clean, and many people who have challenged it have ended up becoming Christian in the end because there's reasonable faith for it. In a courtroom scene, there was a man named... Um, Dr. Jeffrey McDonald, and he went to court in North Carolina. And he sat there before the jurors eating a tuna fish sandwich, reclining in his chair, and looking over at the jurors had just decided that there's no way that they could convict him, that he was innocent as all get out. You see, Dr. Jeffrey's, his wife had been killed, and he told the, the cops that, that an intruder had come in and had ended up fighting with him and knocking him unconscious and then ran up to uh, his wife's bedroom as he was on the couch because they had an argument and was intoxicated. And he had run up to the bedroom and the intruder had murdered his wife and killed his family. And so he was convinced he was innocent. He had his alibi, he had his story, and... He did, there's no way they could convict him. But as they continued to investigate, they looked at the evidence of the case. The detectives saw that there was no overturned furniture. There were no signs of a struggle to collaborate his story, his alibi, his testimony that he had been given. There were no eyewitnesses. Everyone had been killed. And so you would think, well, his alibi must be true because there's no witnesses. But as they continued to investigate the story, they saw that there were just holes within his testimony. That he was the only eyewitness account, but the holes from the old collaborating evidence showed that he was guilty and he was actually convicted and then confessed. You see... This is what we're going to do with the Christian faith. We're going to put it on trial. 
Wayne talked last week and did a wonderful job talking about the eyewitness accounts of Jesus through the Gospels. That we have eyewitness accounts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Our whole New Testament is written by eyewitness accounts. And then even Paul, who wrote three quarters of the New Testament, is an eyewitness account because he calls himself the 13th apostle because he saw Jesus on the road to Damascus after he had resurrected. And Paul, who became a murderer in, for the Christian faith, he put Christians to death. He was one of the ones who gave the approval for Stephen to be put to death in Acts chapter 7. He was the one that they laid their coats at his feet, and he gave the sig signal for them to stone Stephen because he was a believer in Jesus Christ. And he went to Damascus looking for other Christians to kill, and when he finds Jesus, his whole life turns around. And he becomes one of the best and greatest missionaries to ever exist. And he wrote three quarters of the New Testament, which gives us evidence and testimonies that this Jesus who died actually did resurrect from the dead. In fact, other eyewitness accounts will show, as Dwayne talked about last week, the brother of James who was an unbeliever. And here's the question, what do you need to do? to convince your brother that you are the son of God? What do you need to do in order to convince a family member that you would be God in the flesh? You see, your family probably would not receive that very well. Your siblings wouldn't. And it wasn't until Jesus resurrected that James became a believer because he saw him firsthand die, and then he saw him alive. And so he says, he is the son of God. Everything he's been telling me over his life, I now believe. And James went to death stoned because he believed in Jesus. Over 500 people saw Jesus after he resurrected from the dead. So that's what we're talking about. We're going to bring in all this collaborative evidence. We saw the eyewitness accounts last week. And this week we're going to talk about the collaborative, the, the outside evidence that points to the witnesses having a true testimony of our Christian faith because there's different things of faith there's actually three types of faith and if you want to fill this out in your handout I got a couple lines for you go ahead and write this down the first one is unreasonable faith unreasonable faith this would be the type of faith that somebody would have despite the evidence so in the crime scene no furniture had been overturned there was no markings on the victim that he had had a struggle. And so in spite of the evidence, you're going to choose to believe that it's true. You see, my kids try to do this to me all the time. I'll say, hey, did you brush your teeth? And they'll say, yes, I did. And I know that they could not have brushed their teeth in the time span that I gave them in the bathroom because they went in and they came right out. And I'm like, how was that even possible? Did you just like look at your toothbrush and say you brushed your teeth? And then I'll say, open up, show me your teeth. And they'll open up their mouth, and I'll start seeing little orange plaque lines all over. And I'm like, did you brush your teeth? Yes, Dad, I brush my teeth. Despite the evidence, they want me to believe them. Despite the evidence, they want me to have faith in them. But the evidence points against them. It points against their testimonies. You see, some of us, we call this denial. And some of us have lived in denial for a period of time. I'm talking to every single person who got into a relationship with somebody that you knew you weren't supposed to be in a relationship with. I'm talking to every single person that maybe you were in a relationship and that other person maybe was not faithful to you, unfortunately. And despite the evidence, you knew in the back of your mind that that person wasn't being faithful, but you choose to believe them anyway. You choose to trust. That's unreasonable faith. There's a lot of religions that are based on unreasonable faith, despite the evidence. That's not the Christian faith. The second one is blind faith, believing in something without any evidence. You have no evidence of it, but you're going to choose to believe in it anyway. This is where we put a lot of theories into practice. You know, we say, well, what happened here? What happened there? We don't know, but we're going to choose to try to believe it anyway. We're blind faith. We're walking to what we cannot see. And then the third one is reasonable faith, believing in something because of the evidence. And what I want you to know is our Christian faith stands on reasonable faith. You can be a Christian and test the evidence scientifically, 
medically, historically, liter literary. You can do this all and still come down on being a believer in Jesus because when you test it, you'll see that there's evidence that shows that we have reasonable faith. You see, every human being exercises some sort of faith that a chair will hold them up if they sit down, that a spouse will be faithful when they enter into those marriage vows. We enter into a faith that we believe what we're told when we go to school and the teacher will teach us the information. And then there's other things that will collaborate that, like textbooks and stories. And, and so every single person has faith. It's what you're going to believe. Are you going to have faith to be against the Christian faith and be an atheist or an agnostic? Or are you going to have faith and be a believer? But everybody has faith. And so we want to put Jesus on trial and show that there is real evidence. Acts 1-3. Acts 1-3. You got that on the screen? Acts 1-3. After his suffering, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He prepared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. You see, this is Luke. Luke wrote the book of Luke, and he also wrote the book of Acts. In fact, Acts was a continuation of the book of Luke. And so as Dwayne started in Luke 1, 3 last week, this is where I'm getting a little confused with the verses. Dwayne started with Luke verse 1, 3 last week where it said, in this story that I write to Theophilus, okay, what he's saying is my beloved testimony that I'm giving, this is a continuation of that in Acts 1, 3 where he says, after his suffering, talking about Jesus Christ, he presented himself to them. So Jesus rose from the dead and he presented himself to the people and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. So he's saying Jesus proved that he was alive after he resurrected by showing himself to the eyewitnesses. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. So he's training his disciples to become apostles as he's sending them out. Before he resurrects to heaven, he rose from the dead and he spent 40 days on earth showing himself to different people. Over 500 people saw him because he was around on earth for 40 days. You could go and sit with Jesus. You could talk with Jesus. You could see Jesus. And so he showed himself giving many convincing proofs. And this is what Luke is recording in the book of Acts. And there's different types of evidences. There's circumstantial evidence in a court case, and there's collaborative. And this is what we're going to talk about with the circumstantial evidence of the court case. You see, there's different people who have made cases against the Christian faith that Jesus rose from the dead. Not that he existed, not that he died. Nobody uh, debates that. Every single scholar who's credible will say that Jesus lived on earth and he died. There's sources in the Bible, there's sources outside the Bible. Nobody refutes that Jesus Christ died on a cross. What they refute is what he, he res from the dead, whether he was resurrected. And so this is where they come up with different circumstantial evidence. They try to disprove the Bible by different things. And one of the things they've said is, well, here in Luke 3, verse 1, which I just read, and I'll read it again, it says, Licinius being the tetrarch of Abilene. You see, what they said was he didn't exist in this time period. There were no tetrarchs. There were, there were no tetrarchs that existed when Luke was writing this when Jesus was around, they believed that it came much later. For years, scholars pointed out that this evidence that Luke didn't know what he was talking about, since everybody knew that Licinius was not a tetrarch, but rather the ruler of Chalcis. And so what they're saying is that there's two, there's, there, there's, he couldn't exist in an earlier time period, a century earlier, and still exist when Luke was writing this down. So if Luke can't even get these little bitty details right, then obviously he's not a credible eyewitness. He's not a credible witness to the case. And they used to think about this as Luke talked about this. Can we put that on the screen? Luke 3, 1, it says, In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor over Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his, Phil, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iteria, and Triconius, Tis, and Licinius, Tetrarch of Albaline. You see that very last part is what they're debating, that Tetrarch, which means governor 
of Abilene. They're saying there's no way he could have existed this time to be a governor because he existed a century earlier. And so Luke can't get these details right. And Luke is so profound with the details. He spends time on the details. He gives dates. He gives time periods. And we can see who existed at what governor when they mention these governors and they mention the officials and they mention names. What we can see 2,000 years later is we can begin to put dates. We can see that this is historical evidence that Luke is trying to proclaim. And so it's like us saying, oh, in 1957, this is what happened. In 1969, this is what happened. Luke is describing it in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. And so he's giving a specific date, and they're saying, well, that date's wrong. And they believe that. Up until they found through archaeology an inscription was later found in the time of Tiberius from AD 14 to 37, which names, and we got a picture up here if you want to put it up. There's an inscription that they found through archaeology. And in this tablet, it actually says in the inscription that Licinia was the governor from AD 14 to 37, which would have placed him exactly at the date that Luke is describing within his gospel account. And so they say, well, how is that? It turns out that there's two names. There's two people who were written that are named Licinius. You see, it was a common name. And so it's like going by, oh, Chris, the pastor of the Source Church, and then talking about, oh, Chris, the pastor of this church down the street. You see, it's a common name. There's two different individuals, and they found this through the evidence of the archaeology that they described. Another circumstantial evidence they see in Acts 17.6, where it was described as the Polytarchs in Thessalonica. The Polytarchs in Thessalonica. Acts 17.6 says, but when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials, shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. And so the Christians are out spreading the gospel. Paul's out planting churches. And in Acts 17, 6, what they do is they drag them in before the city officials, which actually means tetrarch. That's the, the Greek word for that. Tetrarch means city officials. So it says that they dragged them before the city officials. Well, for a long time, people thought Luke was mistaken because no evidence of the term polytarch had been found in the ancient Roman documents. And so what they're saying is, well, this, this term for official doesn't show up until centuries later. Centuries later is when this word polytarch shows up. And so how is Luke using this Greek word polytarch back in the first century when they didn't even exist? It's like having a job description for somebody not yet. And so for the Source Church, I'd love to have a, a job as somebody to be able to do marketing, right? They could do marketing for us. They could do our Instagram, our website, all these different things. And I'd love for that to be able to be a position in the future. I'd love to have other positions too where we can have like a youth person that was actually on staff and they, they're full time. What I'd really love to do, and this is the five-year vision of, of our church, is plant a second campus. Well, what does that mean? It means that we would have to raise up a whole other worship team. It means that we would have to raise up another a pastor, and then we would send that pastor out with a group of people to actually plant. Because I'd actually love to have another church that we're working together, that we're reproducing, because that's exactly what Jesus calls us to do, is reproduce. And so in the five-year plan is, let's raise up more leaders, and then we're going to send them out with some finances, some blessing, and we're going to commission them to go out and plant another church. And so that's the future vision. But it's like me writing the person's name right now who we're going to hire. You would say, I'd have to be a prophet to be able to do that. Because I'd have to look five years into the future. I, I don't know who we're going to hire. I don't know who God's going to bring to this team. I don't know who we're going to bring on. And so that's what they're saying about Luke is there's no way in Luke's time and day that he could have wrote about this Roman official. He must have made it up. Until through archaeology again, they discovered an inscription. On the first century arch was later found that begins, and we have a picture here. It says, in the time of the polytarchs. 
And you can actually go to the British Museum and see it for yourself. Now, archaeologists have more than 35 inscriptions that mention polytarchs. Several of these in Thessalonica where they actually dragged Paul before the Roman officials from the same period Luke was referring to. You see, archaeology, the circumstantial evidence, is pointing to our Bible being accurate and true. There's outside evidence that begins to show that what we read is actually based not just on blind faith, but reasonable faith. I'll give you one more. Contradictions in the witness testimonies. Contradictions in the witness testimonies. You see, I get this question all the time. They say, Pastor Chris, when I read the Gospels, why is it that one Gospel will say this and one Gospel will say that, but it's the same story, but they have different details? And I'll explain to people all the time, well, if I'm giving a detailed account and this other person's giving a detailed account, we're going to have different perspectives on the story. The main story is going to be the same, but we're going to have a little bit different details. But there's one detail that is really slipped up here, and people had an issue with it. And it was the contradiction between Matthew 20 and Luke 18. And I'll read it to you. It's where Jesus he healed a blind man, and it says, As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And so the part that's in um, debate is here the contradiction as Jesus approached Jericho. Now have that in your mind. As he was approaching Jericho, that's when he healed this blind man. But if you go to Matthew 20, it says, as Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho. So which is it? Is, it, is he going into Jericho or is he going out to, of Jericho? Is he entering into jo Jericho or is he leaving Jericho? Come on, God. If you're going to be the author of your Bible, you need to get it right. What's going on here? And as they've studied, this is what they've discovered. That Jericho was a place that was often destroyed and replanted. And so there was actually a city that was scattered. It's like having multiple places in Pembroke Pines. You can have it West Pembroke Pines or you can be in East Pembroke Pines, but it's still Pembroke Pines. And so in one place of Jericho, he's actually leaving. In another place of Jericho, he's entering in. It's like saying, hey, I'm going over from 75 going into East Pines. And you're saying, oh, he's leaving Pines, but he's still going in Pines. All he did was cross over 75, which I don't know if you know, but sometimes it's like an imaginary border. Right? We have these imaginary borders as we go from Broward County to Dade County. There's not a wall. There's not a separation. But for some reason, people will say, oh, they're going over. You know, it's like they're going over this imaginary border. They're going over this imaginary line. This is what it was for Jericho. He was leaving one place of Jericho and entering into another place of Jericho because it was divided up into four different regions that had been built. And so one person gives the account that he's entering in. Another person gives the account that he's leaving. It's right there in the middle that Jesus heals this person. Luke, Luke gives reference to over 32 countries within his gospel, 54 cities, nine islands, finding not a single mistake as they studied history and archaeology. Isn't that incredible? 32 countries are mentioned within the book of Luke, and they've been able to excavate and find them all. Well, let's do this evidence of cross-examination. Let's, let's cross-reference some of the, the things that they've debated over time. Let's give a cross-examination to defend Jesus. You see, they talked about the census. In Matthew 2, we see this thing of the census. And Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This is the first census that took place while Curianus was governor over Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. What's in debate was they asked, could everybody really go to their own town? There's so many people. Was that even real? Did that even exist? And here I want to show you an outside source where it says, Gaius Vibius Maximus, Prefect of Egypt says this. So this is a source outside the Bible dated around the time of Jesus in the first century. 
And it says, seeing that the time has come to the house, the house census, it is necessary to compel all those for any cause whatsoever are residing out of the provinces to return to their own homes, that they may both carry out of the regular order of the census and may also attend diligently to the cultivation of their allotments. So here is a governor outside the Bible who's writing, who's recording that they did take censuses at that time, and they asked people to return back home. And so it is common to think that as Caesar Augustus issued a decree, the Roman governor, he was asking for the people to return back home so he could count them. It took place historically inside the Bible as well as outside the Bible. Well, they began to debate this, whether Curius was really governor of Caesar at the time of Jesus' birth. So if you go back to that passage where it says, um, in the days of Caesar Augustus, go back there. And it says, this was the first census that took place while Curius was governor over Syria. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This is the first census that took place while Curius was governor over Syria. You see, they begin to debate this name, Curius. Is Curius really the governor over Caesar? Did he really exist back then? Because outside documents show that he really died in 4 BC, and Curius didn't begin ruling Syria until AD 6. And so if Herod died in 4 BC and Curius didn't start ruling until AD 6, then Luke must have got his dates wrong because he couldn't have began ruling when Jesus was being born but start in AD 6. You see, they say the time periods didn't line up. But here's what happened. An eminent archaeologist, Jerry Vandeman, had done a great deal of work in this regard. He found a coin with the name Curious on it in very small writing, and I got a picture of the coin up here. This places him at proconsul of Syria and Cilicia from 11 BC until after the date of Herod. And so what they're saying again is that there were two Curiouses, one who actually began to rule in AD 6, but it was a, a very common name so this one places him because it's described on the coin from 4 BC to AD 6. I know this is a lot of dates and information, and if I'm boring you, but what I want you to see is that there's archaeology that has shown that what Luke is writing is true. I'll give you a second one, the existence of Nazareth. No ancient historians or geographers mentioned Nazareth before the 4th century. So they say Nazareth, Jesus came from Nazareth, you know, Nazareth wasn't even a town that existed back then. It didn't even show up. Nobody wrote about it. So we have no historical accounts outside the Bible that dates Nazareth until 4th um, century A.D., so 400 years after Jesus. So obviously this town didn't exist, and so it must be wrong. Until they began to discover, again, through archaeology, that some writings... And here's what they believed. You see, Jerusalem fell in AD 70, and Jesus predicted that that was going to happen. Jerusalem went to war with the Romans, and they tried to get free. And they believed that Jesus was going to be the one that set them free, but he didn't. Because he wanted to set them free spiritually and not physically. He wanted to set their souls free, their spirits free. But they thought that he was going to do an uprising which is why they lost faith in him when he went to the cross. But eventually it did happen that there was a war that took place between Jerusalem and Rome. And in that war, Rome won and Jerusalem fell. And the temple was destroyed, as Jesus predicted it was going to happen. And so now with the temple being destroyed, that there was no priests that needed to work in the temple. So what they did was they relocated all of the priests to go and be somewhere else. And here's what they found. They found after Jerusalem had fell, they uncovered first century um, writings that shows the relocation of the priests of where they sent. And one of the priests that they relocated, it says that he came from the city of Nazareth. They had also uncovered first century tombs, which tombs could not be within the city. They had to be outside the city. And so you did not bury the dead within the city. And those tombs, they were able to actually show how big the city was because they measured one tomb to another. And here's 
what they found is that they believed that there were less than 450, less than 450 people within the city of Nazareth. It was a very small town, which backs up what our Bible says, because if you look at John 1, 45 through 46, here's what it says. And I think we have it on the screen as well. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, they said. Remember, it's a small town, small village. Only 450 people exist there. It's like a big, it's, it's like a church, okay? And they're calling that a village. Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. And so the Bible says that it was a place that they did not see as very big, as well as the outside resources. Give you one more, the slaughter of Bethlehem. They said in Matthew 2, you know, the critics have looked at it, and they said, well, Matthew 2 couldn't really be true because when, here's what it says, when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and the mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child and kill him. So he got up, took the child and the mother during the night, and he left Egypt. And what they say is, well, there's no really reports that Herod did this uh, killing to all these children. We don't have any documents that show this mass killing. And here's the thing. If Bethlehem wasn't hardly any bigger than Nazareth, Bethlehem was also a small place. They wouldn't have recorded these babies being killed because out of these babies being killed, there's maybe 400 or 500 uh, babies being killed. And it wouldn't have been that big a deal to the city. And here's why. Because Herod was a mass murderer. Herod killed his own family. Herod killed anybody who tra was, was against him. He, he killed his sons because he thought that his sons were trying to get political power over him. And so Herod, in order to keep his power, was willing to kill anybody. And so for them, they didn't have the news. They didn't have media. They didn't have newspapers. It wouldn't have been this mass story that said, oh, hey, look, go. Uh, Herod did this, this, this incredible uh, act where he just wiped out all these children. They didn't have a way to report back then. And so the story wouldn't have been widely circulated outside the Bible because it wasn't that big of a deal to them, even though it's a big deal to us. So that circumstantial evidence goes against, again, the Bible being inaccurate. Well, here's what I want to say to you. Here's some corroborating evidence. Corroborating evidence. We have the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were discovered in the 1950s. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, and, and here's the thing. Whenever you write a resource, you want to have it um, near the time of when it, the event actually happened, else they no longer take it as factual. And so if I'm going to write a story, I'm going to want to write the story like today and not 20 to 30 to 50 years from now. If I wrote it 1,000 years from now, you could say that story has changed. It's like playing the game of telephone. We had an Old Testament document, but the oldest one we had was 1,000 A.D. So that means over a 1,000 period of years, uh, the Old Testament was rewritten, 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 and our oldest manuscript that we had was at 1,000 A.D., which is 1,000 years after all the events from the Old Testament happened. So we're like, did things change? Did things get written in as they rewrote it? Did people make up these stories? 1950s, a boy is out there throwing these stones, and here's a, a pot break in half, and he climbs up and looks in the cave to where he heard the noise, and he finds all of these, these um, clay pots. And inside these clay pots are what we know as the Dead Sea Scrolls today, which are in the museums. You can study them. You can look them up. So this was actual... Um, scrolls written before the time of Jesus Christ. It dated all the way back. It made a thousand year gap. As they began to study the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's the book of Isaiah, uh, the book of, of Genesis, the book of um, all, the, all the different ones that they collected, Lamentations and Jeremiah and Kings and Second Kings. And as they're studying these, what they have found is that the Dead Sea Scrolls point our Bible 95% accurate. 95%. Now you say, where's the 5%? 5% were punctuation errors, where they did not put a period or a comma or they missed something. We stand on the truth as you look at it. 
We stand and we have evidence that points to it. And God is revealing that evidence over a period of time to us. Why is it that we look at other books, like the book of, of Hermes and, 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 and these other books, and we say, you know what, they're factual, but we only really have five copies of them. And they date four centuries, five centuries after it took place. And yet our Bible we can date and we have thousands of them. And we have the Dead Sea Scrolls and we have all this information and yet we still doubt it. Well, let me give you one more testimony from an outside resource. This, this man, Josephus. And here's what Josephus wrote. And Josephus was seen as a traitor, so why on earth would he help out the Christians or Jesus? You see, Josephus, he was uh, somebody that worked under the Roman governor, but he used to be a Jew. In fact, Josephus used to be a Pharisee who was against Jesus and against the Christians. So there's no way on earth he would write something for the Christians or to collaborate a story if it was not true to enhance the Christian faith. And Josephus, he was captured and, and given the privilege because they said, okay, all these Pharisees, we're going to kill you during this war with Rome. And Josephus says, well, I don't want to commit suicide and I don't want to die. So what, I, what I'll do is I'll surrender and I'll volunteer to go and work for you. And he did. So he went underneath the Roman government and he began to record for them. And here's something that Josephus writes as a Roman gover governor historical document. And it says, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite torture on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, or origin suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our prosecutors, Pontius Pilate. And a most mischievous superstition thus checked for the moment, again broke out only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome. Accordingly, an arrest was first made of all who pleaded guilty. Then upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted, not only much of the crime of firing the city as of hatred against mankind. You see, what he's saying is the crucifixion actually took place. There was an uprising against Christians. There was a persecution against Christians. There was a Christian following after this man, Jesus, who went to the cross. And Josephus is writing this as a recording document, as an outside source, as an outside testimony. One more I'll give you. Here it's written, the greatest eclipse of the sun. It became night in the sixth hour of the day, so that stars even appeared in the heavens. There was a great earthquake in Bithynia, and many things were overturned in Nicaea. Now let me ask you, does that ring any bells of any scripture stories? There was a great eclipse of the day. Darkness covered the earth. Mark 15.33 records it like this inside our Bible. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. Right around the recording of Jesus' death and crucifixion. You see, outside sources are collaborating our Bible. Outside sources are pointing to the evidence that the witnesses within the Bible are accurate and true. And so here's my closing argument to you. If Luke took the time to describe every single little detail of places, dates, time, and events, what makes you think that he would not get the big, larger events accurate and true. If Luke took the time to get things right that were small and detailed, what makes you think that he would not be accurate and true in the larger, greater scheme of things? You see, I try to teach this to my kid. Here's a principle. Do things right the first time. Do things right on a smaller scale. Do things and pay attention to the things that you do that are small, because why? Then I can trust you with the larger things. You see, Jesus teaches us the same thing. He says, be faithful with the small things. Be faithful in the little things. Be faithful in the details. Because when you're faithful in the details, when you're faithful in the small things, you can be 
faithful in the large things. You see, if you're faithful when you go to the grocery store and you check out and you say, oh, you didn't ring me up for this item, I'm going to be faithful, then you know when it comes to an opportunity to steal from your boss or embezzle from your boss or Satan comes knocking on your door and said, here, here's a black market scheme right here. Are you going to be faithful to God? If you're faithful in the small things, you will be faithful in the large things. That's what Jesus is trying to show us that Luke was faithful in the details. He was faithful in the small things, and so he could be challenged with the larger things of writing the gospel for us, for all people to see. Luke will not be forgotten. He will ever be remembered as one of Jesus' followers and recorders of the Bible, of our gospel, of the life of Jesus Christ. 2,000 years later, if we're still here on earth, we're still going to have the book of Luke and Acts. Amen? Because Luke was faithful in the small things. And so let me ask you, can God trust you with the small things? Can God trust you as you leave this place that you're going to pay details to the things that you think aren't really that important? When God says to be obedient, are you being obedient in the small things of your life? Because he can't trust you with the large things if he can't trust you with the small things. He can't trust you with the greater things if he can't trust you to be obedient with the little things. And so how are you going to be obedient? The last thing I want to tell you is that God, being magnificent, the creator of all the earth, being as large as he was, paid attention to the small things. He paid attention to every single detail. The Bible says that God knows how many hairs are marked on your head. God says that he knows, the Bible says that God knows how many uh, sins that you've committed, how many thoughts that you've had. He knows what the past, he knows the present, he knows the future. He knows the babies being created inside the womb. He's designing fingernails, he's designing eyes, he's designing colors, he's designing sight, he's designing toes, he's designing all of these things. He knows the little minuscule bugs and ants and created them. God created all these things. He created the reproduction through the entire world of how things reproduce and all these things of how they eat and how they survive. He paid attention to colors and designs. He paid attention to all of these things. He's numbered you and the days of your life and the number of hairs you have on your head and he designed you and made you wonderful and created you and paid attention to all of the details. Now, why is that so important? That God paid attention to every single detail. Because here's what I want you to get. If God cares about every single small thing, what makes you think he's not going to care about your large things? What makes you think he's not going to care about your problems? What makes you think he's not going to care about your finances? What makes you think he's not going to care about your children? What makes you think he's not going to care about your marriage? What, does, what makes you think that he's not going to care about your job? What makes you think that he's not going to care about your health and your sickness and your disease? What makes you think that God is not going to care about the large things that you're struggling with if he paid attention to all the small details of the entire world? God cares. He cares about you. He loves you. And you can give him all of your problems, all of your stress, all of your struggles, because he is the one in control. And he cares about the small things. And he did the small things. And he created the small things and communicated the small things and designed the small things that we see as small. And so we can give him the big things, knowing that he is in control and he has it all taken care of. He knows what's going to happen tomorrow. He knows what's going to happen next week. He knows the future. You don't, but he does. And so we can have trust and faith to place it in his hands because he cares about you. Amen? I'm going to ask for you to close your eyes this morning. We're going to pray. Because I know that there's some people in here that need to hand over their struggles to God. They need to hand over their stress. And I know we went through a lot of different historical dates and research and, and findings through archaeology and all those things, and maybe that puts you to sleep. But what I want you to hear most of all is that this Bible is the truth of the Word of God. 
And God cares about the small things of this world, and he cares about your large problems that are large in your eyes. They might be small in his eyes, but they're large in yours, and he cares, and he wants to deal with that. And so if you want to hand over any single one of those problems to God, I'm just going to ask for you to pray right now with me. Father, you tell us through your word that we can come to you anytime. And we can give you our stresses and we can give you our anxieties and we can give you our problems and that you will give us peace and rest. Father, a lot of times we hear that, but we don't have the assurance of it. What I want more than all anything from this series, Lord, is for you to come into this place and give people assurance. Assurance of their salvation. Assurance of faith. Assurance that their Bible is true. Assurance what they read is true. Assurance that you have their back no matter what. Assurance that you are in control. Assurance that they can hand you their problems and not take them back. Assurance that they can give you their over their addictions and you will set them free. Assurance, Lord that our faith is not in vain, that we do not walk blindly, that we do not walk in spite of the evidence, but we have evidence that we can stand on as truth. Give us assurance this morning, Lord, as we hand you our problems. Father God, anybody who's dealing with anything that they're just anxious about right now, I just pray that they can give it up to you. And they just pray with me. Father, here you go. This is yours. I'm going to trust you that you're going to take care of this. I'm going to trust you for the future. I'm going to trust you for tomorrow. And I'm asking you to give me the faith that I need today. If any of you want to put your faith in Jesus Christ because you've never done that, If you've been a skeptic your whole life and you've been trying to figure out if this Jesus is true, I pray that through this series that you realize that Jesus Christ did rise from the dead, that he was the first, and he promises us we can have eternal life if we believe and receive him. It's not just believing, it's receiving. And so I'm just going to pray right now, if you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and receive him as your Lord and Savior, all you do is have to admit that you're a sinner and receive his forgiveness. It goes like this. Father God, I know I'm a sinner. I no longer want to do life alone. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins, and I receive you as my Lord and Savior as I surrender to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.